Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Hey, so this week we're learning about impact evaluations, right? Trying to tease out what is the impact of some sort of um, government policy or some sort of a treatment on a group of people. Okay, so, so last video you watched kind of about what an impact evaluation is in general. Today we're going to learn about a type of impact evaluation called a randomized control trial. It is a really clean and um, uh, concise way to figure out what uh, the impact really is. Uh, okay, so let me pull up the slides. All right, you should be able to see those. And as you can see, we're studying about uh, randomized treatment design. Okay, so randomized control trials. And let's see here. So uh, remember, what we're trying to do is we're trying to establish this idea of causal inference. By causal inference, I mean how much is the effect that a treatment has on an outcome of interest. All right, causal inference looks not at the total change in the outcome, but rather the amount of change directly caused by the treatment and that treatment alone. So establishing causality is not straightforward. In fact, it's actually quite difficult to establish causality. We talk about this a lot in, in economics. What's the difference between correlation and causation? We want to know the change that's directly attributable to some sort of um, uh, a treatment. Okay, and so uh, in general, the math here is, is this is the way we write it. So this is alpha, and this stands for the impact, the amount that uh, of change that some sort of a treatment or a policy had on the people. Now, how do we measure that? Okay, so this is not as confusing as it looks. Why is the thing that we're trying to measure? Okay, so why might be, let's say for uh, poor individuals in Africa, it's the number of years of school. So we have the number of years of school. Maybe that's what Y is, okay? And so we care about Y conditional on, or this line here means conditional on, P, that's the program equal one. So Y conditional on them getting the program or whatever it is that we're uh, establishing, whatever treatment we're giving the individual, minus Y, okay, so that's the same thing, the number of years of school, conditional on P not having occurred. So it's like this. This section, this term right here, says this is what the outcome variable is, the number of years of school. If the person gets the treatment, this is the number of years of school they get if they don't get the treatment, all right? So I subtract these from each other, and then the difference between the two is alpha, and that's the causal impact of the program. Okay, so basically what you need to do is you need to know the value of Y of somebody both with treatment and without treatment, and then you just subtract them from each other and uh, you can find the difference and that is the um, causal impact estimate alpha. Okay, but hey, <laughs> there's a bit of a problem here. If somebody gets the treatment, they can't also not get the treatment. In fact, there is no way to measure somebody when P equals one and P equals zero. You can't measure the individual both with and without the treatment, right? P equals one and P equals zero. So once you give the person the treatment, you're in this world. If you don't give the person the treatment, you're in this world. You can't be in both worlds simultaneously. So how on earth do you calculate alpha, right? There's no real way to calculate alpha, okay? Um, the first half, why the outcome, given that they got the treatment, is actually fairly easy to measure. Remember, so alpha is, is this term minus this term, okay? Uh, this first term is easy to get. We just measure the outcome of interest for the people who participate in the treatment. We go and we get their value and we measure the years of, that they took school. However, for those same people then, we cannot obtain this for those people since they've already undergone the treatment. All right, so how do we figure out, in order to calculate alpha, which is what we're after, how do we calculate this second half? All right, well, we must estimate it since we can't measure it directly, okay? And this is the tricky part of a randomized control trial, or really any impact evaluation. You have to come up with this word called a counterfactual. Maybe you guys have heard of this word before, but counter means against, in fact, what really happened. So we have to estimate what would have happened to the person if they didn't get the treatment. And then we subtract that off of what happened to them when they did get the treatment. And then we can be certain that the only thing that's left is the change in the variable of interest that's directly attributable to the treatment. Okay, so uh, it's a little bit of a tricky thing, but I'll show you how, how um, development economists uh, estimate it. Okay, so here's how you estimate it. Um, you either use a comparison group or a control group. I'll talk about 
talk about basically how this happens. Basically, what you want is think about it. You want two people that are perfect clones of each other, all right? You want pe two people that are perfect clones of each other. One of them gets the treatment, one of them doesn't get the treatment, and then you can just look at the difference, and then hey, any difference between the two people is directly attributable to having received the treatment, all right? So if we could identify this perfect clone, it'd be easy to calculate the size of the impact, all right? Let's just pretend for a minute that every individual has a perfect clone out there in the world, okay? Suppose we wanna measure the impact of a cash transfer on someone, this is a popular, um, development uh, uh, development context intervention where they, you give cash transfers um, on the number of candies purchased by an individual. Why the number of candies? I don't know. It's the one in the textbook. This is what they use, right? So here's the beneficiary. They're the person who got the cash transfer, right? And this is the clone. They didn't get the cash transfer. This guy was able to afford four candies. This guy was able to afford six candies. Hey, how much did this cash transfer here? What was the in the causal impact effect, I know what it was. You just go alpha, so this is alpha. This is y conditional on p equals one. This is y conditional on p equals zero. And so it's two, two candies, right? The additional cash allowed the individual to buy two more candies. We can say exactly what the impact effect was, right? But we all know it's impossible to find a clone. Even identical twins have different characteristics, right? So instead of being able to find a perfect clone, we rely on the law of large numbers. What does the law of large numbers say? This says that if you get enough people, two different groups, if you just randomly start filling up the groups, they might, look, start, they might start out looking different, but if you get enough people, their averages start to converge to the same number. So on average, they actually start looking the same. And this is actually true for any group as, as long as you just keep populating them randomly with people. As the groups grow bigger, they're going to start look the same on average. So basically, instead of finding an individual clone, we do the next best thing. Thing. We find two groups that are clones of each other due to the law of large numbers. Okay, so we find a clone group. Now, you might ask, how big do these groups need to be? Most economists like to use about 100 individuals at least. Um, more is always better, clearly, uh, because the estimates will be more precise. Okay, and so we have these two groups. We call one group, we give them the treatment, and this is called the treatment group. We have another group that doesn't get it, and it's called the control group, all right? And so we have two groups, they're clones of each other on average because they're big, they each have more than 100 people in them. And um, the difference, we'll, we'll give one the treatment, one won't get the treatment, it's called the control group. And the difference between the two will be the causal impact estimate. All right, so how do I construct a control group that is identical to the treatment group in every way except having received treatment, okay? So basically, in general, we want them to be the same in three important ways. And you, you can probably think this through, like this is what we want. We want the groups to be the exact same um, in three important ways. So in the absence of treatment, the two groups have to be identical. All right, so it's not that every individual has to be identical to another individual, it's that the averages of the two groups need to be equal. This is really important. The, the, the two, the treatment group and the, and the control group are clones of each other. The individuals inside there don't need to be clones of each other. It's just on average, the two groups need to, need to be equal to each other. Uh, the treatment and the control groups should, at least in theory, respond similarly to the treatment. Okay, they both have to respond similarly. And the groups cannot be differentially exposed to other treatments during the testing period. So you can imagine why this uh, is would be a problem. If the treatment group both got your treatment plus got something else and the control group got nothing, then you're not sure the difference between the two. You're not sure if it's attributed to the treatment that you gave them or this other thing that they got. All right. Note that the presence of an exposure to other confounding treatments is actually not a problem. So as long as both groups, say, get um, a job training program rolls out at the same time you're trying to run this experiment, you're like, oh, it's going to mess up my data. Well, not really. As long as both groups are equally exposed to the job training program, it won't make a difference. Okay. As long as both groups undergo the same other treatments. Okay, and so when these three conditions, uh, the one on the previous slide, are met, the control group, we call it a valid comparison group, and it's an actual counterfactual, and then we can compare the two. But we have to make sure that this, uh, that they're the same between the two, right? But when it is, and this is so cool, in this situation, and only in this situation, any differences in the outcome of interest Y are directly and, co and causally attributable solely to the treatment, since it's the only, 
difference between the two groups. And that underlies how we do this impact evaluation. We create two groups. One of them is a treatment group. One of them is a control group. They're identical on average, not the individuals. They're, they're identical on average. And then we give the treatment to one of the groups. And then we compare the difference between the two, right? So while it may not be possible to find a perfect clone for every individual, we can actually identify a clone group quite easily, which will allow us to calculate average estimates. If the comparison group is for some reason invalid, right, that is to say it's systematically different than the treatment group, we would say that the impact estimates are biased. That's what we use. So if someone did a bad job and got a uh, comparison group that's not actually a valid counterfactual, then uh, we say that they're biased. That's the word we use. Okay. All right. So uh, let's talk about ITT versus TOT. You're like, what? All right. So remember alpha. Alpha is the causal impact uh, estimate. All right. And so remember alpha is equal to the outcome of interest when they get the treatment minus the outcome of interest when they don't get the treatment. Now, what does an alpha exactly measure? Well, it might measure this thing called ITT or TOT. Let me explain. All right, so it's the ITT estimate or intention to treat impact estimate when we consider that P equals one to mean any individual who could have received treatment, okay? Um, alpha, on the other hand, if we defined P equals one as only the, the individuals who actually were treated, we call this the treatment on the treated or the TOT estimate, okay? You're like, what on earth am I talking about? Well, here's what treatment group, what do I can consider to be treated? The fact that they were able to get treatment or the fact that they actually took the treatment, okay? Uh, not all the time when you offer people treatment, I mean, people are human, humans and they have free choice, just because you offer someone treatment doesn't mean that they're actually gonna get the treatment, okay? Uh, if there is full compliance, and that means everybody followed what they're supposed to do and everybody who was offered the treatment actually up took uh, undertook the treatment, then the ITT and the TOT estimates will actually be the same. But this is often not the case because not everybody actually follows through with all the directions that they were supposed to. Okay, so here's an example. Suppose the treatment is a deworming pill that was given to children and only 90% of the children in the treatment group take the pill as directed. So you remember back from um, Miguel's paper that we talked about last chapter, there they dewormed children in Africa and they were like, hey, how did your school um, attendance change when, when we dewormed you, okay? Well, listen, they gave wor worming pills to everybody, but their kids, not everybody actually took the worming pills, did they? Let's say that 90% of the children in the treatment group take the pill, all right? So now, what do I consider as being, quote, treated? Do I consider all of the children to whom I gave a pill? If I do, then the number I'm gonna calculate is called the ITT, the intention to treat, right? Because it was the intention, our intention to treat all of the children, okay? And if we actually only, only for the children who actually took the pill, right? If that was what we consider treated, the children who actually took the pill, we consider a treatment on the treated. So do you understand this really important difference between the two? Just because they are exposed to the treatment doesn't mean they actually took the treatment, all right? And so why would you use the difference? Well, the ITT estimate is useful if we wanna know the average effect of a treatment if we were to offer it for the whole population, with the understanding, of course, that not everybody's going to comply. So if Miguel goes and, and presents the results of his paper to uh, the government of, uh, I think it was Mali in Africa, then he might give them the ITT estimate, say, hey, look, if you give this pill, this treatment to everybody, you're gonna have this, this amount of effect, right? Usually, ITT, the ITT effect is smaller than the treatment on the treated. Why? Because there's a bunch of people in here, or maybe not a bunch, there's some people in here, that estimate, that did not actually take the pill and didn't get treated, and so they're pulling the average down. Remember, this is the average of the groups. Okay. Let's talk about some invalid counterfactuals or invalid comparison groups. And these are very, very common, all right? Stories about all the time of studies that have used invalid comparison groups. And you might actually recognize these. People make these invalid comparison groups all the time on Facebook, on CNN, on the news, on the internet. Man, you'll see these all the time and they're, they're, they're trying to or um, they're trying to say that they're causal impact estimates, but they're really not, 
okay? And so the first one is the before and the after. You'll recognize this all the time, right? Um, okay, so in this method, the, the first term, which is the outcome of interest conditional on getting the treatment, is measured as the post-treatment outcome as usual. So this part is the fine part, okay? This part is the bad part, okay? What, how do we measure the, tr the outcome if you didn't get the treatment? Well, you, sometimes people will say, hey, it's measured as the same individual before he or she received the treatment. Okay, so uh, a Jenny Craig weight loss video is exactly this, right? You have a before and an after picture, and they're like, hey, the only difference was um, the Jenny Craig weight loss, and look how much weight this person lost, right? No, 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 right? A bunch of different things changed between the two, all right? So this is absolutely not a valid control group. Let me show you an example, a poor example in the development context, all right? Let's suppose that former farmers in a poor country, on average, produce 1,000 kilograms of rice every single year. <clears throat> One year, the government jumps in and gives uh, fertilizer to all the farmers, and the average production per farmer goes up to 1,100 kilograms. And so the government says, hey, look, this policy we did gave everybody 100 extra kilograms. It must be the causal impact estimate. The increase of 100 kilograms must be attributable to our policy of giving fertilizers. Boom, this is unbiased, and look at what a good job we did. But is this really unbiased? Is this really unbiased? Well, what really, really matters is not what the farmers used to produce, but what they would have produced that year if they hadn't gotten fertilizer, okay? Let's suppose that that year, the, uh, the, the year of the treatment was actually a drought year. And if they didn't have any fertilizer, they would have only made 900. They wouldn't have even made their regular 1,000. Well, actually, can you, can you see that? The actual causal impact estimate is between 900 to 1,100. And so it actually should be 200 would be the estimate would be the uh, impact estimate. And so therefore, the government's estimate of 100 kilograms is less than 200 kilograms. And so we would say that the effect is biased downwards. So when we say a impact estimate is biased downwards, that means it is too small. Okay. And the problem here is there's omitted variables that are going on. At the same time, we're going from the before to the after, a bunch of other things change in the before and after. And we call this OVB in, in econometrics. You might've heard this OVB. This is just another example of omitted variable bias. Okay? All right, so let's look at this picture on, the, on this slide here. So um, the, the year, this is what they got, 1100 is what they got in the year after they did fertilizer. Okay, so here's, here's amount on this axis and here's time in this axis. So in 2007, they, this is what they did with no fertilizer. 2008, they applied fertilizer. 2009, they harvested. And so we look at the difference. Now, if in fact, they would have gone uh, 1,000 in 2007, 1,000 in 2008, 2,000 in 2009, well, that's the before after effect. That's the difference between here and here. Okay, we're like, oh, we probably, they probably would have ended up at B. So the difference between A, which is what they actually did, and B, which is what we hypothesized that they would have done in the absence of fertilizer because that's what they've always been doing, that's the before and after. So alpha is equal to 100. But what if actually they would have produced down here B? Do you see that? What if, in fact, it was a drought year and with no fertilizer, they would have come down here and done D? Then the real alpha goes from here to here, right? It's the difference between those two, and that would be 200. You see that? So then our, our before-after estimate would be biased downwards, right? Well, or on the other hand, what happens if it was just a good year and they all would have produced up here at C anyway, right? So then the real difference would only have been between A and C. And so that would make our uh, estimate of 100 biased upwards. So do you see the real impact estimate is the difference between A and well, I don't know, wherever they would have been in the absence of fertilizer, but it's sure not what they were before, a year before, because it's a completely different year, all right? So that's known as the before-after estimate. Be on the lookout for this. We see this all the time. It's an invalid estimate, and the estimates are biased. All right, so another one you might think is, well, if I want to know how good people are doing who got the treatment, let's compare them to people who didn't get the treatment, 
Okay, this is known as the with and without comparison. Hopefully right away from the very beginning, you can see why this is a poor impact estimate method. Okay, so here's how they do it, right? They measure Y, conditional on B equals one, getting the treatment as usual, that's fine. This is the part, it's the creation of the counterfactual. They measure the outcome of the people who didn't get the treatment. People who didn't did not get the treatment are probably not the same at all, <laughs> right? Um, let's suppose the government institutes a job training program. Okay, this is another common um, third world country uh, development treatment. Okay, so uh, let's say that after initiate, the government puts in place a job training program and then wants to know how much the program increases the worker's salaries. So worker salaries is why, okay? Um, luckily though, they know that Y conditional on P equals one. Okay, they know that that's the people who got the treatment, but Y conditional on P equals zero, they know they can't do the before after because the country is experiencing economic growth. And so we know that people, everybody's getting more money anyway. So we know we can't compare before and after. So they're like, I know, let's not compare before and after. Let's compare the people who got job training with the people who did not get the training. And so that's what the government decides to do. Right, P equals one is the people who receive training, P equals zero is the people who did not receive training. But job training for programs, how do they work? There's voluntary sign up. You're not forced to do it. So um, not everyone who had access signed up. And those who did and those who did not are probably different in very systematic and perhaps unobservable ways. Like probably maybe the better, harder workers signed up and the worse workers didn't. And so when you compare the difference between the people who got the job treatment and the people who didn't, you're actually um, going to measure the difference in the quality, right? So if some workers know they're of high quality and some know they're, they're of low quality and the high quality workers sign up and the low quality workers do not, if I compare the with and without, what I'll actually be doing is comparing a group of high quality workers to a group of low quality workers and the difference in those, um, salaries are going to be attributed not to the job training program, but I will mistakenly think that they are. What I'll really get is the difference between the quality, okay? So clearly the average income of the high quality workers will be higher than the low quality ones, even without, even without a training program, right? And this is known as selection bias. Perhaps you've heard of this, okay? We can't compare people who got something to who did not because they self-select into, into getting the treatment, okay? And so now let's ask about what would be the best comparison group, all right? And so the best estimate of the counterfactual comes about through what's called random assignment. This is similar to what the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, does to ascertain the effectiveness of a new treatment. Perhaps you've heard of this, right? It's called a, a, a medical trial, right? And so the individuals are randomly assigned into two, and they're usually equally sized groups. One group receives the treatment, and the other receives what's called a placebo, all right? And then at the end of the trial, they compare how healthy the people are who got the treatment versus the people who got the placebo. Any difference between the two, because they're randomly assigned, and then this group was forced to take it, right? So that we don't allow the people to choose, because if the people choose, then it's gonna mess this up. They're not gonna be a valid comparison group. And the, all of the difference has to do, uh, is directly attributable to the treatment, okay? Unfortunately, um, in, in development treatments, you can't give like, oh, one person a job training program, what's the placebo for that? There's no real placebo, okay? But in every other way, an RCT uh, is very similar to a medical study. I suppose for the worming uh, one, you could give them a placebo. You could give kids a fake pill that didn't actually kill worms. That seems kind of a messed up thing to do. The parents think the kids are getting dewormed and they're not, but uh, I guess you could do that. I don't recommend it ethically, but for the... So, with that important caveat aside, most of the time we don't have placebos, all right? And so uh, let's talk about when we could do an RCT or randomized control trial, which is what we just talked about, okay? Let's think, think about um, the government wants to uh, roll out some sort of a treatment to help the po reduce poverty among poor people, and they can't afford to um, give the, the treatment to everybody. Well, we could turn that into an RCT. What about, and this is the case in the PROGRESA program that we've talked about in Mexico. The program is going to be rolled out gradually because there's a lot of people, there's a lot of bureaucratic infrastructure that needs to, 
to um, come into place. We need to figure out how to pay all these people. So we're going to slowly phase it out. Well, look, we can randomly get some people to start out and then um, uh, the other people who haven't started yet can be the control group. And if they're random, if they're all random, then it's a great control group. All right. So when the government can't afford to give a treatment to all individuals, then randomly assigning some to get the treatment creates a treatment and then also creates a valid control group, the people who did, right? Now, some people might have ethical objections to this saying, hey, if we're gonna roll out a poverty reduction program, we should give it to the most poor first. It's true, maybe that is a good idea, but it's not gonna be a randomized control trial if we do that. So if we really wanna test it out, maybe we just, randomize it, even though there's a cost, but the benefit is greater than the cost. I get some really useful data, okay? Many social programs really do take a while to roll out, with some individuals getting the program in year one, some individuals get it in year two, etc. right? And so if the individuals who get to participate in the program in year one are randomly assigned, and then the people who don't get the program are used as a control group, this could be used as a very useful RCT. Okay, and this is cool because we can actually measure, with just a little bit of planning, we can measure the actual impact of some sort of a uh, government policy. Okay, and so, you know, we get cool data, and there's another benefit too, because let's think about being in the third world country, and only some people are gonna get access to money first, right, as the program rolls out. Well, that's gonna open the door for bribery, for knowing you know, who you know. This could be really unfair means of rationing the, the few slots to begin with. And so an RCT could actually be more fair. It could overcome that ethical objection we talked about earlier because, hey, it's more fair. The people um, just random, the people who get to get the money first or get the treatment first are just randomly um, assigned. And so that seems more, more equitable, all right? It can actually increase transparency and fairness in sometimes corrupt third world governments, right? So this actually can be a, a good thing besides the fact that we get a bunch of really cool data on the causal impact estimate. Okay, so to evaluate the, uh, the validity of a control group and to make sure the impact estimates aren't biased, it's always important to compare the sample statistics of the treatment and the control groups. So basically what we do is after we make uh, treatment and control groups, to make sure that they're actually random and somebody didn't mess up or somebody didn't cheat to try to get in the treatment or control group, right? What we need to do is we need to check the averages of the two groups and they should be nearly identical, okay? And so uh, the first thing you should do in any study that purports to be an RCT is check what are known as the summary, oh man, my computer's not working, summary statistics. <laughs> Summary stats, I'm just gonna put that here for now. All right, so you gotta check these things called the summary stats. And we'll talk a little bit about that next video.